6. The Hindenburg Disaster The 1930s was the golden age of air travel, especially for those who could afford the luxury of booking a flight on a Zeppelin, like the Hindenburg. Cut the time required for transatlantic travel in half compared to even the fastest ships, and not only that, but passengers could travel in luxury. They had their own cabins and a multitude of rooms, including a luxurious dining room where they could eat accompanied by a live piano and even a special smoking room. Unfortunately, all that would change on May 3, 1937. The Hindenburg left Frankfurt at 7 a.m., heading across Europe, ready to start its transatlantic crossing at 2 a.m. the following morning. At 4.15 p.m., the Hindenburg was due to land at its final destination at the Lakehurst Naval Airfield in New Jersey. But the captain, Max Pruss, was informed by Charles Rosendahl to delay the landing as a storm had picked up in the area. The Hindenburg waited out the storm by hovering around the coast of New Jersey until two hours later. Captain Pruss considered it clear to come in for landing. The landing itself was far from smooth. Originally anticipating and working with an easterly wind, Pruss and the rest of the crew worked their landing calculations accordingly, aiming to take an oval-shaped trajectory in the air while they lowered altitude and lined up with the landing strip. Yet, in the middle of maneuvers, the wind abruptly changed direction from the east to the southwest, causing the crew of the Hindenburg to execute a series of sharp turns in order to adjust their position for landing, as well as venting excess hydrogen gas to help with the descent. However, as the Hindenburg was about 180 feet above the ground and readying the landing ropes, a wave-like fluttering was seen near its tail before there was an eruption of flame. Within 37 seconds, the flames had consumed the ship, sending it crashing to the ground in a fireball that shocked the world. Out of the 97 people on board, 35 people lost their lives in the tragedy. Many of these survivors suffered serious injuries as a result. Passengers reported being flung around the cabin before desperately smashing open the side windows in the promenade in order to jump out to safety. Those in deeper parts of the ship were not as fortunate. The Hindenburg disaster was not the worst loss of life from a Zeppelin crash, but it served as one of the final nails in the coffin for airships. This is because the entire tragedy was caught on film and watched by shocked audiences all over the world. 5. The Panama Canal Traffic Jam Traffic jams don't just occur on the roads, and there's an ongoing problem in Panama that's likely to have global implications. The Panama Canal, a major trade route running from the Atlantic to the Pacific, has experienced an unprecedented level of drought. This, coupled with the historically inefficient management, has meant that the water level in the canal has reached a record low. This means that fewer ships are given clearance to traverse the canal each day, with the number dropping from 36 crossings a day to 32. While you may think that just four fewer ships a day seems like a silly number to point out, even this minor reduction has had major impacts on the Panama Canal. There are now hundreds of ships full of cargo lined up at each side, just waiting to be able to cross. This blunder is likely to have the largest effect on those living in the USA, as delayed goods will cause the cost of existing ones to rise. And as over $270 billion worth of US goods make their way into the country via the Panama Canal each and every year, that's a lot of money. But how have things been allowed to get this bad? One of the reasons behind the recent issues lies in something that should have stopped them from happening in the first place. In 2016, a third lane was added to the Panama Canal, which would increase the amount of traffic able to make it through by a significant margin. However, when this was implemented, those in charge failed to realize that in order to have this extra channel, they would need more water in the canal in order to support it. You may think that it would be easy to funnel more water into the Panama Canal, but there's a key problem. The water for the canal 
also shares its source with the drinking water provided to the people of Panama. As of this video, the Q-Dub ships at the Panama Canal keep on growing in number. Who knows when a solution will be found? What's the longest traffic jam you've been in? Let us know in the comments down below and don't forget to click that subscribe button. 4. The St. Francis Dam Disaster The St. Francis Dam was constructed in San Francisquito in California in 1926. It was built to create a reservoir for the Los Angeles and Owens rivers. The project was overseen by William Mulholland, who was a respected engineer at the Los Angeles Bureau of Waterworks and Supply. So, when cracks and leaks started to appear while the dam was being built, no one doubted Mulholland when he told them that these were nothing to worry about. However, this would go on to become one of the worst engineering disasters in history. Two years on, on March 7, 1928, the dam was finally ready to be put into use. It was filled to capacity and Mulholland went down to inspect it, declaring that the dam was safe. Just five days later, more cracks started to appear in the dam. Just before midnight on March 12, the concrete wall completely collapsed, sending a deluge of water down the canyon towards the Pacific Ocean. In the way of the entire reservoir's worth of water and its final destination were at least four towns, Castile Junction, Fillmore, Bardsdale, and Piru, which were completely flooded and destroyed by the dam break. Over 450 lives were recorded as being lost to the St. Francis Dam. However, it's likely that the true death toll is much higher than this. Many bodies were never recovered due to the force of the water washing them away, and the area was a hub for many transient farm workers and illegal immigrants for whom records would have been hard, if not impossible to find. After the tragedy, an investigation took place through which it was found that the dam should never have been built there at all. The rocks around San Francisquito were in no way suitable to house a reservoir or a dam. However, rather than facing justice for the sheer engineering negligence on his part, Mulholland was cleared of any charges against him. But understandably, his reputation was so tarnished that he never worked in the sector again. Three. The Columbia Space Shuttle Disaster Columbia was built by NASA and was the very first space shuttle to be used in spaceflight back in 1981. In contrast to other rockets, space shuttles were designed to be reused multiple times, making them perfect for ferrying astronauts and scientists up to the International Space Station, which was under construction at the time. In 2003, Columbia went up on her 28th journey into space on January 16th, taking seven crew members with her. Rick Husband, Michael Anderson, David Brown, Kalpana Chawla, Laurel Clark, William McCool, and Elan Ramon. The crew engaged in various pieces of research, as well as helping with some of the construction of the ISS. The team also performed experiments around the clock in areas such as fluid physics, material sciences, and life sciences. After a two-week stint in space, it was finally time for Columbia and her crew to return to Earth. However, as the space shuttle began re-entry on February 1st, tragedy struck. Abnormal temperature readings and disappearing sensors caused mission control concern as they reached out to Columbia. The response back from the shuttle was Roger before another word that was cut off mid-sentence. Mission Control tried again to try to get in touch with the crew, but they had no success. Soon after, reports started to come in of a space shuttle that had been recorded breaking up in the sky by a television network. Their worst fears were confirmed. Space Shuttle Columbia and the seven crew members on board were declared lost that same day. But what happened to cause such a catastrophic failure of the space shuttle? Upon launch, NASA noticed a small amount of foam break off of the bipod ramp, which connected the external fuel tank to the shuttle. This foam then struck the left wing of the craft, something which seems insignificant but would turn out to be fatal. The foam created a hole in the wing, 
which allowed for atmospheric gases to bleed into Columbia as it returned to Earth, eventually consuming and breaking apart the space shuttle. The search for debris from Columbia in order to gain answers was a lengthy process. Because of the altitude at which the space shuttle had broken up, the wreckage had spread across an area of around 2,000 square miles within eastern Texas. Eventually, NASA managed to retrieve 84,000 fragments, accounting for nearly 40% of Columbia's total weight. Among these recovered materials were the remains of the crew, which were identified through DNA analysis. The debris was laid out meticulously in a hangar back at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, showcasing just how many small pieces such a large spacecraft had eventually become. As for the astronauts on board, in 2008, NASA issued a report on the survival of the Columbia crew, offering insights into their final moments. It suggested that the astronauts may have survived the initial breakup of the Columbia shuttle, but they quickly lost consciousness within seconds as the cabin's pressure dropped, a small consolation for what was such a terrible tragedy. 2. The Sultana The Sultana was a wooden paddle steamer built in 1863. Her primary purpose was to transport people and cargo between St. Louis and New Orleans on the Mississippi River. On April 23, 1865, not long after the conclusion of the American Civil War, the Sultana pulled into the port of Vicksburg so that her boilers could undergo repairs and maintenance. While the ship was there, the captain, J. Cass Mason, was given an offer from the U.S. government that he could not refuse. He would be paid a considerable sum of money to transport former Union soldiers who had been held as prisoners of war in Confederate prisons back home to the north. In order to be able to meet this contract, instead of a thorough repair and overhaul that had been planned, Captain Mason chose to just patch up the leaky boiler of the ship to save time. The capacity of the Sultana was 376 passengers. However, the ship soon found itself carrying far more than this, as over 2,000 prisoners were being held in Vicksburg and were crammed onto the ship. Captain Mason did this out of fear that other ships and captains might be bribed to poach the soldiers in order to take the money for themselves. Rightly so, there were concerns about the ship being overloaded, but these were dismissed by Captain George Williams, who was overseeing the transport of the troops. The Sultana set off on her way. The journey would put a lot of strain on the steamer's boilers, as not only did she have to deal with ferrying far more passengers than she should, but the Sultana was also fighting a much faster river current on the Mississippi than usual, caused by the spring thaw of that year. Eventually, the boilers exploded, blowing a hole in the middle of the ship alongside starting a catastrophic fire on board. Although many of the prisoners on board were lucky enough to be able to jump overboard, a lot of them died trying to make it to shore. Not only that, but out of the survivors who did make it to dry land, 200 of them subsequently died due to severe burns sustained due to the fire on board the Sultana. All in all, 1,195 of the 2,200 people on board the Sultana lost their lives that day, making it the deadliest maritime disaster in U.S. history. 1. The Great Molasses Flood the people who lived and worked on North Boston's Commercial Street in 1990 were used to going about their day while there was a metallic groaning and wailing in the background. This noise came from a large 50-foot tall tank owned by the United States Industrial Alcohol and was full to the brim with molasses. Molasses were used extensively in order to create both alcohol and ammunition, critical to the war effort in World War I. However, since the conflict ended in 1918, the need for it slowed. Boston had an unusually mild winter in January 1919, with the temperature usually over 40 degrees. As a result, the street bustled with activity. On January 15th, the piece was shattered by a tremendous metallic roar. The molasses tank had burst open, sending a 15-foot wall of hot, tar-like syrup 
cascading down Commercial Street at a speed of 35 miles per hour. People were either knocked back by the tidal wave of stickiness, or they were consumed and suffocated by it. The force of the substance was so strong that it even managed to rip the Engine 31 firehouse on the street clean off its foundations. Just as quickly as it had started, the wave of molasses receded, leaving chaos in its way. The cleanup and rescue operation would be a significant effort. Police, firefighters, and sailors from the nearby USS Nantucket scrambled to try and save as many people as they could, including those trapped in pockets of molasses, such as the men who'd been in the firehouse at the time of the disaster. In the end, 21 people died and 150 people suffered injuries. Rightly, the people wanted answers and filed lawsuits against United States industrial alcohol. It turned out that the walls of the tank were far too thin to be able to hold its contents, something which employees had signposted before but had been ignored. Keen to avoid blame, United States industrial alcohol claimed that the tank had exploded due to sabotage dating back to the First World War. But thankfully, the courts ruled in favor of negligence on the part of USIA, ordered them to pay $628,000 in damages, a sum that would equate to $8 million today, making for a bittersweet ending to this tale. Thanks for watching. Which one of these engineering disasters shocked you the most? Let us know down in the comments and don't forget to hit that subscribe button for more videos. See you next time. Bye.